Hey queer friends, are you ready to be inspired? Welcome to season five of Coming Out and Beyond, a podcast that shares stories from the LGBTQIA plus community. Here's your host, Anne-Marie Zanzel. Hi, this is Anne-Marie Zanzel here, and I am so excited to welcome you back to Coming Out and Beyond, LGBTQIA plus stories. I am very excited to welcome Krista V. Oaks to the show today. She is a certified yoga and meditation teacher specializing in working with beginnings and beginners and seniors. She teaches gentle and chair yoga classes in Daytona Beach, Florida and nationally online. She leads group wellness retreats and teaches yoga and meditations to corporations. Her classes focus on safety, proper body alignment, mindfulness, and trusting one's self. Her approach to teaching integrates the mindfulness of meditation, lifestyle coaching, and the compassionate approach of Kripalu yoga, rooted in faith and spirituality with humor sprinkled throughout. Krista received her Bachelor of Arts degree from Mullenbar College, where she first discovered the thrill of expressing herself through writing. As a yoga teacher, she enjoys reconnecting with the joy through blogging and communicating with her students. And in January, January of this year, she published her first book titled Shedding Shame, Finding the Freedom to Live an Authentic Life, which she takes you on a journey of her life's challenges. She writes about the shame of her child growing up with gay parents and losing her dad to to AIDS, and the shame she developed from her marriage full of dysfunction and mental illness, which ultimately ending in divorce. She shares her path to unravel the shame holding her back, where she been, and how it's gotten here to her to, to today, living her best authentic life. Krista, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much, Emery. So happy to be here. So I am just going to let Krista tell her story. So Krista, Tell me your story. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I really feel like my story actually begins before I was born. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, My parents, my mom and my dad met in college. And I think one of the things that really connected them was their uh, faith and their spirituality and their their uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And they got married and they gave birth to me and my sister And then a few years later, they started realizing that there were things that, uh, that it was really my mom who really felt like a relationship was meant to be a little bit more than it was. And they started having conversations and my dad revealed that he really, uh, was questioning his sexuality and his desire in the relationship. And ultimately through a lot of discernment, they realized that they were each gay and mm-hmm. they separated, ultimately got divorced. And um, they maintained this incredible relationship and uh, as co-parents and friends. And they each, both my mom and my dad, each found lifelong partners. And we grew up in this family of six. Mm-hmm. But we definitely, I think I was about seven When I started, I innocently said to a childhood friend, I have two moms or something like that. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, we started to get harassed in the community. We had some tormenting, some abuse, some vandalism, and we wound up moving away. And my mom, we kind of made a pact as a family that when we moved and we wound up in our new community that we weren't going to, you know, we couldn't tell people about Mm -hmm. uh, our lifestyle and that my parents were gay. Mm -hmm. My dad lived about an hour away. And so we saw him every other weekend and we would go back and forth. And every time I was with my family and my sister and my parents, it was like, I I felt like I had the best parents in the world. They were really Mm -hmm. just loving. My my moms were both social workers. My dad was a, a therapist. And so we talked about everything and processed everything and we had this just wonderful network, but to the world, we were seen as unacceptable and as, um, you know, wrong and gay people shouldn't be having children. And what were you teaching them and what were the risks and all of that? So we kept it a secret. That must've been so difficult for you. 
It was, it was, it was really, really difficult because I, as a young girl and you're trying to grow up and make friends and, or in my case, boyfriends, and you try to get to know people. And there's always this part of myself that was so important and such a big part of who I was, but that I couldn't share with people. Mm -hmm. And I'd meet somebody new and I, you know, having friends over to the house was always a little bit scary because they'd want to see the house and, you know, my mom and Linda are there and it's like, okay, everything's good. But then Linda doesn't have her own space. You know, how do I, how do I acknowledge the fact that it's obvious that my mom and Linda shared this room? So we had created a whole cover story and there was an office that we said was Linda's room. And um, so we, you, I really learned how to try to be as open as I could about who I was and share myself as much as I could with friends and, and boys that I was trying to get to know. But there was always a part of me that I held back and that I didn't share and that I kept secret. And when there was a time when I thought, okay, maybe this person I can share it with, maybe this boyfriend I'm close enough with, or maybe this girlfriend will understand it was like this whole big discernment process and fear. And, you know, we'd sit down and, you know, was the risk worth it? Was the mm -hmm. worst risk of sharing it with this person going to be worth it? And mm -hmm. there were really very few people that I told uh, as a child, you know, growing up all through my childhood. And then my story continues when I went off to college, Muhlenberg was the college that I went to and it wound up being just such an important four years of my life. One, I, I wasn't living at home. So in some ways the, the secret was much easier to keep because they mm -hmm. weren't, you know, there just weren't the natural questions about who are these people in your life. Um, but it really gave me a chance to explore who I was and, uh, which ideally, I think that's one of the beautiful things about that time in our life. You know, it's kind of the safe, protected opportunity to explore and be mm -hmm. away from our parents. Um, but during that time is also when I found out that my dad and his partner were HIV positive, or at mm -hmm. least technically, we just found out that my dad's partner was HIV positive. Um, my dad actually never got tested, but ultimately they both died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. and that happened while I was at college or actually just after. So they were my dad was sick and unwell and basically going through this process of uh, ultimately dying while I was at college. And so I really had this, it, it was like the grief was so overwhelming that I got to the point where I'm like, I have to tell somebody, I have to well, talk to my friends about this. Now, if you know anything about grief, that's disenfranchised grief because you're grieving something mm. First of all, most people don't understand. Yeah. Most people do not grow up with a gay dad. Yeah. Um, and uh, especially from our generation, this was all happening in the late 70s, 80s, right? Correct. And this was, yeah. Well, yes, yeah, so I was in college the late 80s, early 90s. Okay. So, so you know, I mean, late 70s, 80s. And for those of us who remember the AIDS crisis, um, which is so funny to say that now because it was such a formative part of my young adulthood yeah. because sex was scary. And, you know, it was supposed to be the time of exploration and being able to do all that stuff, but all of a sudden sex could kill you. And so yeah. it was really, really scary. And the internalized, excuse me, the, the homophobia was incredibly rampant. So um, like to be, to say that your dad was gay, like was almost like it was outing yourself. Right. And absolutely. And, so, yeah. and that he had AIDS, you know, that, Which was, that was so misunderstood. So not only is my dad gay, but he's got AIDS, which was thought of this, you know, we didn't understand it. Most people did not. It was scary. Mm -hmm. It was tragic. It was, uh, it, it, it held a lot of fear for, for so many people. About well, and also life. like, as you wrote in your book, it was also like God was punishing the gay community by giving them AIDS, which is yeah. such a misunderstanding of viruses and how they work. Um, but that, I mean, I know for some people that's like, but that's exactly how it was back yeah. then. And yeah. so uh, it, as how it affected me as, you know, somebody who thought I might be gay, I was like, nope, not going to do this. And yeah. so put myself back in the closet, but you had to come out 
and um, because you had to tell somebody. And so you I did. had to tell somebody that, that I remember and I write about it in my book that the day that um, so this was before the Zoom calls and and even FaceTime and, and things. My my parents had arranged a conference call and it was <laughs> not that easy to do so that my four parents and my sister and I could all be on the phone at the same time when they told us that he, Reese had been diagnosed HIV positive which of course we all knew that that meant there was a likelihood that my dad was as well. And that was just such an overwhelming and devastating thing and news that when I got off the phone, I just felt so alone and I just felt so scared. You know, we were at college, my sister and I, so this conference was while we were away at college. So I hung up the phone and suddenly I was alone. And so I called uh, a very dear friend and uh, just let it all out. And that mm -hmm. led to m me beginning to come out f in my own way at college. Uh, but it was did not happen overnight and it was not easy uh, to go through that experience at mm -hmm. all. Uh, mm -hmm. So ultimately- I'm curious, I've, I've been to Muhlenberg. It's in the middle of Allentown, Pennsylvania. It yeah. is it is in, in rural Pennsylvania, can, well, Allentown's not rural, but Pennsylvania can be quite conservative. So yeah. what was it like for you to be in this um, this little liberal arts college in Allentown, Pennsylvania, talking about this stuff? You know, yeah. how was it for you? Well, it was scary, mm -hmm. but I had a really great support system. I did uh, connect with the counseling offices there at school, which were supportive. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, I became really close with the chaplain at the school. Mm -hmm. And he was just this, probably one of the first, uh, just, just such a unique individual. And one of the first people that really, uh, allowed me to be, to speak freely about what was happening and what was going on and what I was going through. So he really was a huge, uh, comfort for me and he supported me creating a group on campus. And I wound up writing an article for my writing class, I was actually an English major. And so I wound up writing an article. Uh, that was the first time that I had really uh, in form in any way, shape or form came public about it. And then when I, they had a woman was coming who had written a book about her son who had died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. And so they were really trying to educate educate and to bring that information to the campus community. And so when she came, they invited me to be on that panel discussion with this, uh, with this woman whose son had died. And that was really my opportunity to come out to my friends in a public way and to other people on the campus. So it was a weird, cause all of those things you said were true, but for me, it was a very, I guess, uh, you know, it, it, it was, I guess, sheltered enough for something that I didn't, uh, I had enough people there supporting me that it was, it was okay. Um, mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of overt things specific, to, unique to that area, but I definitely had that experience of people speaking negatively about gay people or using stereotypes and jargon not knowing my connection to the gay community and therefore, you know, just making me feel small and hurt and shameful and all of those things when, when they would do that and not being able to speak up for myself at that point and say, Hey, listen, you know, let's talk about this. That's not exactly the case, or let's look at this a different way. Uh, so it was, um, it was a really powerful time in my life. It really mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing was, so my, after my, I graduated and about a month later, my dad passed. And mm -hmm. so I started this new life, my dad gone and, you know, I had to kind of grow up a little fast trying to take care of all of the things. Now my mom and Linda, we were still a really close knit family. So my mom was actually my dad's executor and, you know, we were one big family. So we all did that together, but trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. And I actually worked for the agency of HIV and AIDS in DC government for a while. It was my first mm -hmm. real job after college. 
Uh, but if you know, if you've ever worked for government, you know, that's not easy, no matter what the places <laughs> that you're working, you know, didn't, didn't stay there very long. But it's at that point, I'd say it was about a year after my dad passed that I uh, met my, my ex-husband. Um, so and- there's more to this story, but I want to ask some questions about okay. coming up before we get to the next part, because the okay. next part is very important too. Yeah. Uh, and so First of all, the, you know, what your book is about overcoming shame and, and I can understand, you know, shame is, there is something wrong with me. You speak in your book about being really resonating with Brene Brown. And I've actually really resonated with that, with her TED talk as well. And, um, you know, your parents your moms, especially in the interest of keeping you safe and keeping their their family safe, um, uh, also sort of inadvertently, they were just trying to keep every really taught you to be shameful about their queerness. Yeah. Have you reflected on that? And, and and like, how do you view that now? I don't think it was, um, it was not intentional. It was just about keeping everybody safe. And I completely understand that. But like, you know, I, I think about, for example, you, your mom and Linda, Linda's her partner, her mm-hmm. wife, correct? Yes. And correct. like, you know, I think about like what Linda must have felt like when, you know, she had to pretend the office was her bedroom, you know, and because as somebody who lives in a queer relationship, I can relate to that. Yeah. And so, you know, like as you've begun to unpack your own shame, how have you begun to review view your yeah. childhood, which actually was like the way you describe it. It sounds really wonderful, like yeah. your love of Christmas and, you know, and how magical your parents made it. And and yeah. honestly, it's very unusual to have four grown adults. Yeah. <laughs> Parenting, <laughs> parenting together, yeah. especially yeah. with those dynamics. I think your mom and dad seem to have a very unusual and loving relationship. Yes. Um, and so, you know, I mean, like it sounded magical to me. It sounded really, really lovely. And um, but now as you start to think about it, how did they model shame for you? Yeah. So well, the that was definitely a process of unpacking all of this. Right. So, yeah. Uh, actually Absolutely. a chapter in my book where I talk a little bit about how the bigger challenges in uh, for my with my parents or in regard to my parents was more about having a step parent than the fact that my mm-hmm. step parent was a woman than having two women as my sort of primary parents are in the household. But um, you wrote about it so beautifully, Krista. Thank you. I, thank I have, you. I, my wife is a step parent, so I get it. Yeah. And you really like your understanding and the way you write about it and such grace because, you know, she was 26. Yeah. My gosh, can you imagine? Like, this would be the last thing I wanted to do. Yeah. I was 26 years old. Yeah, I know. And and, and only reflecting back, do I really realize now, and again, you know, this is articulated in the book, how much she was committed to my mom and committed to our relationship and how much she had to, surrender and give up in order to be a part of our family, because we, uh, we certainly gave her all the challenges of step parent, you know, you're not my mom yeah. anyway, you know, like, you don't, you don't, you don't easily jive, like, we've got this all figured out, you're creating this sort of like, um, uh, spoke in the Do whatever. You think- but that was irregardless whether she was, if she had yes. been a man and your mother remained, it would have been the same thing. Yes, that's correct. Barb, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Straight women do not lie awake at night wondering if they're gay. Okay, yeah, that's a fair statement. I agree. But what if you've always thought you were straight and you can't get a woman out of your head thinking that you want to be more than just friends? Well, I think the best thing is to do is to sign up for Beyond the Closet Door, our free online workshop, May 7th through 9th at 7 p.m. Central Time. And who's this workshop for? It's for any woman, cis, trans, or non-binary who is comfortable in women's spaces, who who may be rethinking their sexual identity and wondering if they aren't quite as straight as they thought they were. Okay, is this workshop for women of all ages? Yes, ma'am. Great. That all sounds great. So how does someone sign up for the free workshop? So the link to sign up is comingoutsupport.net 
and you'll find it in our podcast show notes too. So that's Beyond the Closet Door, a free online workshop, and you can sign up at comingoutsupport.net. Yep. See you there. I think the shame piece, I think, you know, my mom, when I, when I was writing the book and coming up with the title, my mom actually had a lot of reaction to the title and Mm -hmm. it was really hard for her initially because she said, I don't want, I think it was hard for her to acknowledge the fact that there was shame for me and, Mm -hmm. and her role in that and what that meant for her and, and the fear that people would then interpret that as you are ashamed of your parents or you're ashamed of having gay parents where I try to really reflect in the book that it's exactly the opposite, like you said. And I've actually had some readers say to me, I was jealous of your parents and the, and the, yeah, I was too, you, had, <laughs> you know, because you had yeah. this. And that was really what I wanted to communicate that parenting is a challenge and requires skills that have nothing to do with, you know, your sexuality or who you're married to. And that they were these amazing people. Um, and so I think that uh, I, we spent a lot of time reflecting on that. And and it's hard, right? It's hard to acknowledge. We all have things that we grew up with that are challenging, that are messages that we learn. And, and when I now have my own children, when I, I reflect back on the messages that I taught them, and sometimes I say, and, and again, some of it's in oh. the book. You know, I, I, I recognize that there were choices that I made because I really didn't have any other choice, but those choices ultimately uh, helped them determine who they are and their personalities and, and what they are. So I think that for my parents learning the connections that I was making to this sort of shadow self or having this part of me that, uh, or e- even kind of learning to keep secrets or learning to wear a mask and uh, being able to walk this line of showing up as I am, you know, as a yoga teacher, I try to, you know, just create this environment of authenticity and showing up uh, and create that space for other people. And yet there was this part of myself that I was always keeping secret, that I was always hiding back. And and that makes a lot of sense to me because then you enter this marriage with somebody who wasn't the best person for you to be married to. And we can talk about that. But you had to keep a lot of secrets in that marriage too, because we're always trying to present our best self, right? And so you had grown up presenting the best, you know, presenting what you perceived to be the best self. And your right. childish mind, you know, I mean, we're kids, we don't know. Right. And, um, and so then you meet somebody soon after your dad's death. So why don't you share that part of the story? Yeah, I, I certainly will. And, and I'll just add real quickly before I move on is that I think the reason this book is so relatable is because mm-hmm. even though the shame might not may not be the same as mine, when you read the book, you recognize the secrets that you've been holding on to yourself. Whether Mm -hmm. you were aware of them or conscious about them or not, you start to, it's a relatable concept that we all have parts of ourselves that we are afraid to be open about. And I really appreciate like how you, you tell some really painful stories in there. And I really appreciate like how much you're modeling, like you're not holding anything back. And I really appreciate that you're like, okay, like, you know, I did some things that I wish I could have a do over with and stuff like that. Um, But you're also dealing with with somebody who had some pretty severe mental illness. Yeah. So when I met my, uh, my then husband, you know, I, I fell in love and I, uh, it was about a year after my dad passed and he was older than me and he seemed much wiser than me. He was deeply spiritual and healthy and he kind of uh, epitomized what I thought I wanted and needed in my life. You know, this, I I've always had this really strong, deep spiritual connection. You know, I've always felt the presence of God. I've always understood something that there was something greater than myself, even though uh, it wasn't necessarily in the traditional sense I've always had that connection Mm -hmm. and, but I didn't fully understand it. And I think when I met him, he seemed like somebody who had helped me learn and understand and deepen that connection. 
And we, we just had this really powerful soulmate connection and we were married for about 20 years. And I'd say the first 10 of it was really, really, uh, was really pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. was really pretty good in, you know, we managed in so many ways. We did have two amazing children and after, you know, the marriage changed some after we had children, but uh, some some circumstances happened in the world and and with my ex that uh, kind of took some dormant, I'd say, mental illness within him that brought it out. So the first 10 years, there were little hints of things, but I think that they were pretty tolerable and manageable and, and not so dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. uh, but then about halfway into the marriage, a lot of that became more significant and started creating a lot more dysfunction. And he was very uh, controlling and manipulative. And I think one of the things that I became aware of writing the book was how I had these two very strong beliefs in two things that were completely opposite. <laughs> I had this really, really strong belief that he loved me no matter what, because we had this really, really deep soul connection and uh, felt as though there was, you know, we bared our souls to each other and we really knew um, about each other and could share anything to a degree. Uh, but then there was this other part where our love was very conditional. I, I, definitely felt like I was always uh, being tested and I was always being asked to um, show up in a certain way or, or be different and, and do better, uh, indicating that I wasn't good enough the way that I was. And mm -hmm. he really, and that, that carried on to our children. There was uh, a lot of, at the time I used to call it unconventional parenting Mm -hmm. uh, because I really uh, struggled with using the word abusive. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was definitely unconventional, unconventional. And I do share some of those really, really painful stories in the book where I just knew things weren't okay. And I knew the things that were happening were not okay, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't, some reason I didn't know how to stop it. And reflecting mm -hmm. back, that's some of the most painful things for me now is, you know, it's so, it's so obvious to me now, how looking back, was I not able to do things differently? Well, because you in need the you midst of it. Yeah. You have, you have distance now. Once you have distance, yeah. you can see things differently, but yes. you were in the midst of all of that. I was in the midst of it and I just did not see a way out. And I, I, I think the challenge with abuse and for, in my case, for me personally, it was mental abuse. It's, it's like the slow infectious disease that just slowly eats away at you that um what's that analogy with the frog in the pot <laughs> boil slowly you know yeah. whatever it is it's like you don't even know you're in the hot water because mm -hmm. it just the temperature rises little by little by little and so I, I, you know growing up and with my parents and everything i was this strong powerful independent woman i was going to be president i was going to change the world you know i i never really saw myself as a stay at home mom even i had all of these um just girl power dreams right. and slowly in my marriage that all somehow got stripped away from me now i loved being a mom and i chose to stay home and i and i i'm so grateful i had that opportunity and was able to do that um, but I definitely uh, lost myself mm -hmm. as so many of us do in a marriage. And mm -hmm. he, there was this, it was like in our household, there was always this unsteady, unstable foundation at mm -hmm. any minute and any day. It was like, okay, is today going to be a good day or not? You know, I, I found myself and my children frankly, learn to work, walk on eggshells. Well, you had to walk on eggshells because he was How's that going to be today? You know, it, it, can I be fun loving and free or do I have to be really small and, and restrictive? Um, it must and have been exhausting. It was exhausting. And I had no idea how exhausting it was or even how unhappy I was until mm -hmm. I got some distance from it. Mm -hmm. I use the analogy. It's like a veil that's slowly being lifted and you just start to little by little, you get to see a different perspective. It's, it's, it, it's, it's quite um, fascinating to the point. Now we're looking back, I kind of go, wow, how did that Who was that person? Who was right? that? What, yeah. you know? 
Well, and the more and more distance I get from it, the the more I feel that way. Like it feels like such a different person in such a different world. And in some ways I'm, I'm a lot more connected to who I, who I was when I was in college and I'm right. pretty meeting him. Do you like look back at it? You know, when you're describing all the behaviors in the book, especially in the beginning and stuff, it's almost like it was like, you know, grooming someone to, to do exactly what he wanted you to do and 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 by controlling your behavior by by his over the top behavior to anything he could perceive yes. to be a slight or you not listening to him um you know it, it it it's really interesting because you have a very clear like understanding of like how he like I don't think you yeah. understood at the time but you can right. see like he was doing I don't know I, honestly like I always give you know was it intentional or was it just part of his culture of growing up and and also too he seemed to have a lot more freedom in your marriage than you did yes 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 and yes yes to all yeah. things um yeah it um it definitely looking back, I can see that there mm -hmm. were, there were moments and times. And one of the big ones was making the choice to, to move. We relocated, um, from, uh, from up North to down South. Mm -hmm. And when we did that, we left all of our family. I, mm -hmm. we have nobody, uh, down in Florida and we, uh, you know, this close knit relationship that I had with my parents and my sister changed because mm -hmm. we were further away. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it seemed like this great opportunity, you know, the way it was presented, the way we decided to do it together, it was like, okay, we're going to do this thing. And I don't know, I, I, it's a wonderful question. I choose to believe that it wasn't calculated or really thought out on his part, but I think it's his nature and need to control his environment and his situation and his, the players in his life and, and his family. Uh, so I, I think his perspective on the choices that he made were about taking care of us, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. about doing things that he believed were the right things to do for us. And, uh, he expected us to trust him and mm -hmm. to uh, believe him that he knew best and that these decisions were uh, for all these different reasons that were best for us. And that was pretty much true with all things that. Uh, how do you, how do you did in grooming us, grooming me? Yeah. It's like, you know, you said, you know, you were like, a, a, like, such a person that believed in like you were going to be president of the United States as a young girl and girl power and all that. And then, and, and then you end up in a relationship with somebody who was, I mean, can I tell you probably half the woman in this country has, has the same story. Yes. And it's yes. like, how did I get here? Yes. So yes. I, and okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it, it's okay. I just, I think that, um, I had this, so I think that one of the things that, I don't know how unique this is or not, but I, I really, I really loved him and I really mm -hmm. do believe he loved me and that love that we had and that deep connection and experience that we had early on in our relationship, it felt like I was always trying to get back there to because them. I knew yeah. that potential was there. We had had, and I think that's part of the grooming process intentionally or not you know, when you have this intense, you know, passionate, powerful, deep connection, which for me at the time, I, I didn't, you know, having a more intimate uh, relationship with somebody seemed very rare and unique. And mm -hmm. to truly really have this deep love for somebody felt very rare and unique. You and just reminded so me of something. Do you think he love bombed you? Uh, do you know that term love bombing I, you can articulate it again to make sure it's what i understand the love bombing is like, when somebody like, meets somebody and just like just knocks you off your feet yeah feet. yeah and, 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 and then and then slowly redraw withdraws the love from yes. you yeah yes yeah for yeah. sure again i don't know it's if, difficult to know his intentions 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I do, do, you know, I do believe he loved me. I don't think he got into our relationship with some idea of controlling me me and all these kinds of things. I mean, I think he had his own issues and his own challenges in his life. It's just what he knew. He was Mm -hmm. from a culture that was, had a very strong patriarch. He, uh, he was the patriarch in his family. And so he, uh, that was what he knew that, and that was admired and respected. And that's what men, uh, achieve to be is in control of the family and in taking care of right so it was uh, a little on his part he really I think believed he was doing what he was supposed to do and what he knew to do for himself and for his family um and of and of course this is challenged by the mental illness piece yes uh, because that that does um skew everything and I, and I, and it, it took me a while to accept that piece of it, right? There were behaviors mm-hmm. and things and ways that he behaved that I often said, you know, gosh, I, I, how can he be this mean or how can this be happening? And only after I really understood the mental illness piece, then it was like, oh, okay. He's not just a jerk. He's got these mental illness challenges. And so in a lot of ways that invested me even more in the relationship and finding a way to make it work because it felt as though it wasn't his fault. It was an illness. And I often said, you know, if he had a physical illness, I wouldn't just up and leave because things were difficult. And so I really see mental illness as a, as a disease and as, as an illness that needs and that can be treated and Mm -hmm. managed. Mm -hmm. And, and so it became my mission then to uh, help him with that. And well, it was interesting. I knew we had that potential in the past. It was like, okay, well, if I can correct this piece, if I can fix this, if we can work through this, then we can get back there. Um, yeah, I saw some parallels with him and your dad because your dad would never get tested for it, for HIV, yeah. and and your ex husband would see these doctors, they'd recommend things, and then he wouldn't do it. Yeah, you know, there's like this parallel of, um, uh, you know, wanting help, but also like not. Um, you know, not following through. Yeah. <laughs> and know, I think in the, following in, the in the alternative sort of when you live an alternative like lifestyle, which you know, there's lots of different definitions of that. But so when I was with my uh, husband, we, you know, we met at a meditation center, yeah. right? So we mm-hmm. we believed in whole health and natural health and trying to heal from the inside out, and so that kind of complicated things when you yeah. needed help from you know, traditional avenues. And so that I know really you, yeah. it because he'd, you know, we'd both kind of say, okay, well, maybe medication is a solution, but then that compromises are all these other things that we talk about that we're trying to achieve. Um, and I do talk yeah. a little bit about it in the book because I really do believe that nobody knows what the right answer is and that everybody has to decide for themselves what role medication and medical treatment and all those things that I I think there are so many things and and we had done that and he had done that he had tried so many natural things to manage his uh, mental illness but ultimately it didn't help and the one time that he did go on medication it was like this huge sigh of relief for me it was like oh my god like this is how life could be like like Wow. Okay. So this is possible, but then Mm -hmm. immediately or pretty soon after he'd go off of it and we'd be back. That's typical. So it was again like, okay, well, if I can, if we can get back there, I see the potential for health and and healing. I see the potential of how things could be, but he really struggled to reconcile that with himself because the belief system really was in a holistic approach and, and, you know, the labels and the diagnoses and all those kinds of things, which like you said, contributed to my dad's decisions as well, you know, Mm -hmm. affirming, you know, one, the reason, as I understand it, that he didn't get tested was because he was going to choose to live healthy no matter what. And he wasn't well, going to yeah. the medication at the time, AZT. So he, cause he wanted to heal from the inside. He was macrobiotic. He did all the things, meditated, yoga, all the things. 
And so it was like, well, why do I need to know? It's not going to change the path that I'm on, on how I live my life. Um, and that was very unusual at the time. It's definitely less, uh, more common now, but at the time, well, I find doing that. I've interviewed people in the new age community and sometimes there is much pressure in the new age community that as there is in conservative religion oh, yeah. to oh. learn, uh, the, to live a certain way. Yes. And, um, and, you know, mental, like medication, um, you know, I have fallen on the side is that sometimes we just need a floor. That's right. We That's just right. need a floor. And sometimes you can be the healthiest person in the world. Um, but you need a medication to make your life better. That's right. And, and, and you know, sometimes you need that to help you to, to be able to get to the next step where you can then absolutely. use the natural things to, to, to overcome it. And, and your husband is so, your ex-husband was so, t is so typical of people who take medication for mental health reasons, yeah. because you feel better and you stop. You stop. <laughs> and the reason you feel better is because you're taking the right. medication. And we definitely, you know, we were in, uh, we had a yoga studio and we were kind of had a face in the community and we were building something. And so there was that fear of judgment of, okay. you know, we had to model and we had to show up and we had to, you know, what was the image that we wanted to create in our marriage and, and in well, our it's so interesting. I can see the direct connection from the way yeah. you grew up yeah. to where, okay. So we right. don't have a tremendous amount of time left, but how did you dig out from this shame? You know, like from the shame of not having the perfect marriage, from the shame of mental illness, from the shame of a parent dying from AIDS, from the shame of having parents that were queer. How did you start to like, let this all go? Oh, I, I think a big, huge, I think uh, my parents were a big influence in the sense that they would just ask me gentle questions every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, but really the pinnacle for me was attending a, a retreat mm -hmm. where I was really forced to reflect and spend time with myself and look at the fact that I was unhappy and look at my life from a different lens and mm -hmm. connect to myself and realize that I wanted more and that I, and so that began this journey, which is ironically, it, you know, the book kind of begins at that experience and reflects back and, 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 and weaves through the book on how that experience started me shifting my perspective and mm -hmm. started me looking inward, even though I'd been teaching yoga all this time, I hadn't spent the time or it wasn't the right time. You know, I think it has to be the right time. The factors have to be the right time um, because there were certainly lots of times when I considered getting divorced earlier, um, but the, the circumstances were just right that uh, that was the precipice for me saying, okay, I, I, I have decided I want to live happy and really went to him and said, I want to be happy and I'm going to start living my best self. And I hope you're okay with that. And I hope you still love me. And ultimately he did it when I showed up as who I knew to be at that time in my life. Um, I he, he, ultimately that wasn't what he was game for. And I think I was at that typical place where my kids were starting to get older. I knew there was going to be a time when it was just going to be he and I again, I was like, okay, what does that look like? What do I want that to be like? And all of that questioning and 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 reflecting and and meditating all helped me to discover that that's not what I wanted. I did therapy, I did women's empowerment weekends, and yoga was a huge, huge part of that for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that yoga is a, such a valuable tool for helping us get to know ourselves, to spend time with ourselves, and so I really became a student. For a while, and 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 really um, said, okay, I've got to I've got to live this way of life, not just teach it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you, sometimes we think of yoga as just the the yoga postures we do on the mat, and mm -hmm. yoga as a philosophy and a way of life is so much more than that. And so I really started using that more as my guide, and doing more work, which helped me to just start to realize, you know, I really want more for myself. 
made the connections between my marriage and my growing up, my dad passing, you know, my, my, and that, uh, some, some feelings of loss and abandonment from my dad and how that, even though it wasn't his choice, I don't blame him for dying, but ultimately that was an experience I had and how that, uh, that created the right circumstance for me to then attract a person who, Oh, it was a perfect storm. <laughs> Perfect storm. Yes, my perfect dad storm. had died. I, you know, it, it was like I needed a break. And my ex-husband came in and gave me that. He lifted me up. He, you know, just he took care of you. He took care of me and very well for a very long time. And and I and I was able to just surrender yes. and just let go so that he could take care of me. And I think the piece with the shame about my parents really didn't happen. Until writing this book and which again started many years ago, mm -hmm. the, the forward. How long have you been divorced, Chris? Uh, mm, what is it? Eight, eight, nine years, something like oh, that. So a while. Eight, 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 seven, eight years, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really wrote the uh, content of the book, the, the core of the book after divorce and mm -hmm. really was my therapeutic tool to kind of work through all of these things and the, the therapy experiences I was having and what was coming to me in yoga. And, um, and, and so I wrote it shortly after, and then it wasn't years later that I said, okay, I'm enough distance. The veil had been lifted far enough. My kids were older where I said, okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to share this. But I really think that, um, making time to spend with ourselves and reconnect. And that's part of so much of the work that I do now. I, I, I do hold now I hold my own weekend retreats and cry, try mm -hmm. to create that space for people to really ask themselves the hard questions, you know, mm -hmm. are you happy? What do you want? You know, or, uh, and, and to recognize that we deserve that. Mm -hmm. I think it's so common as women to feel like we're not enough and we lose ourselves and we're not worthy. And so to yoga allows me in my teaching to help other women realize that they are worthy and that they do deserve more and that they can uh, really create the, the life that they want to, to live. Um, and a daily practice of being on the mat helps you do that. You know, weekend retreats can help you do that or week long retreats. Um, but I think that uh, that that retreat is really what what began it. Um, but it wasn't until I'd say mm, maybe, well, I remember not too long ago still, well, it's still ingrained in me that when I'm with my parents, it's a little different now that they live here, but when they would come to visit, and I, they'd come to a yoga class or something and I'd meet, you know, there'd be a student come up and say, oh, is this your mom? And I'd go through this, you know, in a millisecond, this process in my head of, okay, how do I introduce Linda? <coughs> Excuse me. Who do I say Linda is? Is this a safe environment? Am I okay to share this? So that self-talk I was so used to in my mind that it was a process to unwind that and just say, nope, this is okay. I can be open with this person and whatever it is, it is, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So even though society has somewhat caught up, my mind was still that child who was still afraid and still worried about what people would say and what they would think of me. Um, so in so many ways, you know, it's funny because I think a lot of people who read the book don't recognize how much it was not accepted. Yeah. Well, and also to that, that <clears throat> process that you go through in your brain, I do it more about my safety, like, like whether to introduce my wife as my wife, I just do, it's literally like a, a millisecond. Um, most oftentimes I'm in Nashville, it's a blue dot in a red state. Yeah. Most oftentimes I'll introduce her as my wife or say that I have a wife, but sometimes I think, okay, am I safe? It's more about my personal safety yeah. than, than whether, because unfortunately things are getting harder for queer people again. Yeah. So we had a little bit of a, a good time for a couple of years and now things are, there's a lot of real hateful legislation out there. I think just making the decision and certainly the book propelled this for me. But 
I just have, I have made the decision to show up as myself. And each day I wake up and I say, okay, this is who I am. This is who my family is. My this parents is my are story. amazing yeah. people. This is my story. And, and I've had the benefit of getting feedback now from my book where people are saying, thank you. You know, thank you for being so honest, so raw, so open, sharing these things, uh, these regrets that you have and these unpretty stories, um, because I have those unpretty stories too. And mm -hmm. that was really the That's what I appreciated about your book. Yeah, because that was we the all perfect. have those unpretty stories. If we had and until you really have it. permission or real, you know, and I think as a community and as as women, if we can find a way to empower each other to tell our stories, which is it's mm -hmm. lovely that you start all your podcasts with that, because when when you mm -hmm. hear another woman's story it empowers your own story and it gives you that permission and it gives you that right. And it gives you, um, you know, that feeling of you're not alone. Okay. This mm -hmm. woman had that story. Well, mine's not exactly the same, but yeah, I had these same similar things that I held secret that I was ashamed about that were really hard. And the more that we can be open and vulnerable and share our stories, you know, I hope to create this ripple effect of of inspiration and empowerment for uh, other women to to tell their stories. And it's really something I'm hoping to to do even more in the work that I do as a yoga instructor and in my re retreats is to create those opportunities to for women to uh, feel empowered by their story instead of uh, put down by their stories. Okay, so now's the time to self promote. <laughs> <laughs> So um, tell, where can people find you and where, and the title of the book and, and um, anything else you would like to share? Yeah, sure. So my book is called Shedding Shame, Finding the Freedom to Live an Authentic Life. And it is available on Amazon. Uh, you can go to my website, sheddingshame.com. There are links there, but you'll learn a little bit more about the book and a little bit more about my family and some other things. Uh, you know, the whole complete story of the book is is on my website with the links to purchase it through Amazon. Uh, and as far as uh, yoga, I teach both in person and online. So it doesn't matter where you live, even you in Nashville or in Tennessee, wherever, California, wherever you might be, you have to deal with the time zone a little bit. But the classes that I teach in person, I also uh, live stream online. So they mm -hmm. are live classes and, and it's been, um, it's been really wonderful to be able to uh, discover the connection that can be made through mm -hmm. online, which of course uh, the pandemic forced us to try to figure that out. And when I started teaching online, I thought, gosh, I, I'm so used to feeling the energy of the room. Am I going to be an effective teacher online when I'm not in front of students? And I've been amazed at how I've been able to make that work. You know, it is something mm -hmm. that I've worked on and, and create that space uh, so people can take my classes online and uh, and the retreats I've offered at least one, if not two, and working on uh, day and weekend retreats. So my website is yogawithkrista.com. And mm -hmm. I would love to offer your whole community just some free yoga. If any uh, of your uh, listeners want to take some yoga with me, uh, just reach out to me and you can take an entire month of yoga for, for free so that you can oh, start thank you so much. experience what it's like and have a chance to spend some time with yourself. And, uh, you know, one class isn't going to do that. So I really want to give you a, a, an opportunity to know what it really, the potential that it has when you can show up for yourself on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always end this program with asking three questions and I've asked them of you as well, right. because you did have a coming out song because you had to come out as Queer Spawn. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so ironically, your coming out song is one of my coming out songs. Ah. So uh, what is it, Krista? Yeah, so it's Defying Gravity from Wick yeah, Wicked. I used to play it, in, yeah, from Wicked. Yeah. And, and it has, um, it's I actually the, when my when my parents, my my two moms got legally married, so they had a commitment mm -hmm. setting ceremony many years ago. And then when they got legally married, um, I put a video together after it was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, of, of the event to share with uh, family. And that was the song that I found that I put in the background. And mm -hmm. so 
it always, when they got legally married, it was really much more in addition to celebrating their love. It was also celebrating the fact that now that they could under the eyes of the law. And well, so and also really such a celebration of love and also, you know, I never thought in my lifetime that my parents would ever get legally married. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I love that show. And I love that story because for me, now that I have come out of my marriage and really your shedding own the shame, yeah, you know, your it's own like, I, yeah, it's like letting go and just releasing all those things that have been holding me back and realizing that now, uh, you know, I can just soar and the sky's the limit. And so it really has a powerful, that song is means so much to me in so many ways, because it, it really, uh, it makes me think of the celebration of my parents being able to legally get married. And it, and it means so much to me that I am now allowing myself to, uh, to let go of things that were holding me back and holding me down. Well, and also, I just want to say that your parents have been together for an incredibly long time. 40 and, years, 40 something. Yeah. And in the lesbian world, that's defying gravity. Yeah. They yeah. should be really, really proud of yeah. that, especially um, your stepmom, because she was really young when she met your mother and to have hung in there for yeah. all these years is, is pretty amazing because she was only like 25 and she's a baby. And to take that all on is just to me, like really amazing. She must, as you said, the commitment to your mom and your mom's commitment to her, of course. And, has been, and being able to look back now and, and recognize uh, the love that we have for one another and that we work so hard as a family. Um, it just has so much meaning and is, it, it just, you know, it creates a, a deeper, you know, it's not by accident, you know, mm -hmm. families are created and they, they, they need to be uh, worked on right. and we've really done the work. And now she's somebody in my life that I can't imagine not having in my life or, or Absolutely. living. Yeah. And so what was a book that changed your life? So there really were two, uh, the one you mentioned, uh, Brene Brown's uh, Daring Greatly. Mm -hmm. Because that that was also when that time th during that time when I was uh, realizing I wasn't happy but didn't quite know what to do about it, um, that book really gave me the courage and the permission to be vulnerable and to be okay with the fact that things weren't okay. And it, her messages in that book really created change for me of like, mm -hmm. okay, I I it's it's a requirement me to show up vulnerable. You know, mm -hmm. I have to show up as myself, the good, the bad, the ugly, if I want to be happy, if I want to achieve what I want to in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. So the other really powerful book, uh, if it's okay that I share too, is Big Little Lies. Mm -hmm. Because it was the, when I read that book is when I realized I saw my dysfunctional, abusive relationship Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the parallels of the dynamic of the characters in that book, I felt like I was reading my story mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. book. It was physical and mine, it was emotional, but it was the first time when I could not ignore this what cycle that I was in, in my mm -hmm. relationship. And that was pivotal for me to, to, to name that because then it was like, Oh, this is not good. <laughs> okay. I realized like now now that I can see that for what that is, I need to do something about that. So you've done all this work. Um, how would you describe your life today? <sighs> I mean, I'm happy. I can mm -hmm. see that. Um, I really do feel like um, I'm a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we ever really get there. It's kind of mm -hmm. like in yoga and, and, you know, we never have perfect a posture. We're always never working. get to enlightenment. Enlightenment. We never get to it. So I'm certainly a work in progress, but I do feel like I have made the decision to show up every day as authentically as I can. Um, I am in a relationship now where I am receiving unconditional love, which I never really experienced in my relationship before. And that is uh, been a process to receive that and to, uh, recognize that for what it is and how powerful that is. Um, and I, 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I really am showing up as myself each and every other day. And mm -hmm. that's kind of when I, when I left, you know, when I got divorced and, and that was the commitment I made to myself and, and in my new relationship, it really is, it was really clear that I am not going to do anything except what works for me. And I'm going to show up. And if you don't like it, you too, know, bad. <laughs> too bad. And to have that be received has been truly, uh, really powerful. Um, so yeah, that's, and I love my work. I love my work. I love sharing this work with other people. And I love uh, that excitement when I see somebody on their yoga mat or, you know, somebody shares after an aha moment at a retreat where you can see that same experience that I had where somebody realizes, okay, I'm, I'm med made for more. I, mm -hmm. I can do more. I want more. And you can see it in their eyes and you can see it, uh, just that, that transformation beginning to happen. And, uh, that's really, really, uh, means so much to me now that I'm able to do that. Well, thank you. Uh, Krista Oaks, author of Shedding Shame, Finding the Freedom to Live an Authentic Life. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. And thank you for sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to Coming Out and Beyond, LGBTQIA plus stories with Anne-Marie Zanzel. New episodes of the Coming Out and Beyond podcast drop every other Friday. You can tune in at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and at annemariezanzel.com. Be sure to hit subscribe when tuning in so you never miss an episode. And for more resources, articles, videos, and a free downloadable guide for coming out later in life, visit annemariezanzel.com.